Hi, my name is Kim, and welcome to the Walton Advisory Board. Our panel tonight's animal cruelty, and it's going to be amazing. So I'm glad that you're all here. So tonight um, we're going to have a panel and then questions afterwards. Please make sure to keep your questions down to about a minute so we can make sure as many people who want to ask questions can. If you are interested in joining the Walton Advisory Board after you see this magnificent panel, then make sure that you come Wednesdays at 5 at the Dement Lounge. Um, we have a great time. You can choose the different topics that we have. It's amazing, pretty much, to say it in one word. So now I'm going to introduce to you the panelists, and this isn't in any certain order, so you guys can start however you'd like. Um, we have Mike Wellington, and he's manager of the Lane County Animal Regulation Authority. We have Mark Wells, who's the lead humane investigator of the Law Enforcement Division for the Oregon Humane Society. We have Katie Dyer, who's the Director of Marketing and Development for the Green Hill Humane Society. Sorry about this. Switch the script. And then we have Dr. Ingrid Kessler, who's co-owner and staff veterinarian for the Emergency Veterinary Hospital. And Carrie Packard Friedman, who's co-director of the University of Oregon Student Group for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. So thank you so much for coming and enjoy the panel. So when I was asked to speak this evening, of course I was very pleased that the topic is so broad, animal cruelty. Um, that I wasn't quite sure what I should speak on because there are many places in our society where animals are either neglected or abused. And I think some of the hardest things to talk about and think about are the places in our society where those practices are taken for granted and so ingrained that we don't even think about them. From my perspective as a veterinarian, one of the most difficult things to talk about um, but I'd like to talk about a little bit tonight and we'll be happy to answer questions of course afterwards about is the use of animals in the veterinary medical education. I took my uh, doctorate from Michigan State University in 1994 and when I graduated I had not harmed a single animal. That makes me an oddity. Um, most veterinarians who graduate from veterinary school have been required to participate in laboratory exercises including surgical exercises and things of that nature, where animals are used and arguably harmed. And that happens in two ways in the regular curriculum. One is that um, animals, dogs and cats, are obtained from a local shelter or humane society. And the argument, rightly so, is that these animals are slated for euthanasia anyway. And they are donated to the veterinary hospital, or they are purchased and um, they are used to practice surgery. They're anesthetized humanely. Um, a surgery is performed on them so that we can learn surgery and they are not recovered. Another practice that's common is that animals will be obtained from the humane society or local shelter or purchased and multiple sequential surgeries are performed on them and they're recovered in between. So, um, simple techniques like how to pass a catheter, which is a tube that might go in different body parts, would be practiced one week. The animals are kenneled, and then at the next laboratory uh, event, a more invasive procedure is performed. And typically, um, at the end of six weeks or eight weeks, um, the last procedure is something like a broken leg, and we would learn how to fix the broken leg. And then at that point, the animal is euthanized. Um, but it's difficult to think about these animals along the way. And I think it's difficult for the students. I know it was for my classmates because um, we love animals. That's why we go into veterinary medicine. And then we find out um, that unless, unless exceptions are made, um, we're going to be asked to harm animals before we even graduate. And the reason for that is financial. Um, many veterinary schools have classes of about 100 students. And a uh, surgical exercise may be performed with those hundred students and um, only a limited number of professors um, because of a shortage of resources. And I think that that's so much of the problem of, of um, sometimes the way we treat animals in our society is, is lack of resources and how we allocate resources. 
So um, I raised a fuss, frankly, and um, I'm very proud of Michigan State University. Uh, I received an excellent education there. They could not accommodate my needs. I was a conscientious objector. Um, so I was flown to Washington State University for a special summer session where the classes were very small. There were other conscientious objectors from around the United States at that time. And we met there, and the surgical staff there um, worked with us one-on-one -on -one so that we did it more like human medicine. We had a very um, qualified instructor. We practiced on cadavers first, and then we had a very qualified instructor helping us um, side by side with many surgeries um, so that I, uh, in retrospect, uh, received an outstanding surgical education. And by the time I graduated and was working on client-owned animals, I was very confident because I had done those recovery surgeries already. So, um, so I'm a proponent of trying to change the veterinary curriculum, but it's a difficult thing to do and change occurs slowly. Um, and I'm glad that the folks from Oregon Humane are here tonight because I know that they have a wonderful program here with Oregon State and um, that sounds very exciting to me. Now, of course, I've been practicing um, for 13 years. I practiced in a general practice for two years and have been doing exclusively emergency medicine for the past 11. Our hospital is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we see everybody from all walks of life. So I probably see more animal abuse than the general practitioners out there. I'm typically in court, oh gosh, three or four times a year testifying in animal abuse cases. Many of them are straightforward and maybe not even worthwhile talking about. Um, for example, uh, recently I saw um, a man who the um, police department brought in. He was significantly chemically impaired um, on something, goodness knows what. He had called his dog to come to him. His dog wouldn't come, and his response to that was to get out a gun and shoot his dog in the head. Um, the shot was not fatal. So the dog uh, was presented to me at the emergency hospital. There's not a lot to talk about there. This, this man is clearly uh, mentally ill. Um, the police brought him in. Um, we can all agree that that's wrong and bad. Other things are a little more fuzzy, and I just want to share two quick cases with you. Um, I saw a dog several years ago. Her name was Rosie. She's about a nine-year-old terrier. She's adorable. And at the time, she was a puppy. She was adopted into a very loving home. And they had provided a puppy package for her at the regular veterinarian, spent a lot of money. The father of the family has a temper. And on a Sunday afternoon, um, in a fit of temper, when he was in a bad mood anyway, he grabbed Rosie, who he loves, and he threw this little dog against the wall hard enough um, that she had damage to her chest and she broke a leg. And she was presented to me at the emergency hospital. And you could, tell that this, um, you could tell that this man really loved his dog, and you could also tell that he had an anger management problem. Um, so we talked about it, and we agreed that it would be best for him to release the dog to me, that he shouldn't own Rosie anymore, because that was not a safe environment for her. An hour later, his wife called, just angrier than heck with me, thought that I had accused him of being a chronic abuser, um, wanted to reassure me that the dynamics of their home was healthy. The next day, the regular veterinarian called me, also raising some concerns that this was a loving family providing a home for a dog where there aren't enough loving homes. He was deeply remorseful. He was prepared to pay an expensive emergency medical bill to have her attended. And he was, again, deeply remorseful. And so there was an argument made uh, that, um, it wasn't that clear cut as to what should be done with Rosie. And um, I did retain custody of Rosie, and she's in a fabulous home. She healed entirely. Um, but I wanted to point out that, that there are some good points there. It's not that easy. A lot of the other abuse cases I see and end up testifying on are neglect rather than malicious abuse. So for example, I recently saw somebody um, who had uh, boarded her dog. Her dog had behavioral problems. And she boarded her dog with somebody who was going to help fix those behavioral problems. She was simultaneously going through a divorce, and this was a large dog. So it was kind of convenient because her life was changing, and she had this place where she could keep her dog for a couple of months. In the intervening months, she didn't have very good contact from this boarding facility. And she had some questions about how her dog was being kept. But she was in no position to follow up for personal reasons. When she finally, um, regained the dog two months later, the dog was emaciated. The dog had not been fed properly. 
Um, so much so that the dog was presented to me at the emergency hospital and was suffering from severe malnourishment. And that case ended up going to court and tearfully the uh, person who runs that boarding and training facility um, attested, and I believe her, that she really loves dogs and she was trying her best and she had gotten this um, dog all kinds of different foods in an attempt to get him to eat. There are so many species differences that as human beings we don't really understand always that dogs may not eat according to location. It had nothing to do with how tasty the food was. It had to do with the fact that some dogs in a kennel situation will not eat. They'll starve to death first. And I heard a nutritionist, and I love this, say, what if I told you I was going to take you to the most delicious restaurant you had ever been to, and it was going to be the best food that you like done in the best way, but the restaurant is in a bad neighborhood. You can't go with your friends and family. You don't really like the wait staff. You think they might be hostile to you. And you can only eat at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't really like eating at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, nobody wants to go to that restaurant. Dogs experience that phenomenon to a much higher degree. Many of them won't eat sometimes in the kennel. And this poor woman had done what she thought was trying her hardest to get the dog to eat. She had, however, failed to um, get veterinary care. She should have known better. She should have known that she was out of her league and contacted other experts. Um, but I wanted to point out that that was a neglect. She didn't mean anything maliciously the way the guy who threw Rosie against the wall may have committed a malicious act. So much of the abuse we see has to do, I think, with our ongoing understanding and misunderstanding of the different needs of species. And that can be very difficult. Um, and it's something that I have to tell you, you know, 13 years out of veterinary school, I feel that I'm still learning. Um, so at the risk of going on all night long, I'll leave it to my next panelist member. But I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have later on. at a humane society, so most of the animals that we deal with are owned animals, not stray animals. So the types of abuse that we deal with on a daily basis are much more subtle, sort of like what Dr. Kessler was talking about. If you take this newsletter that I passed out to you, and we look on page five, okay, there's pictures before and after of two <laughs> dogs there. So I think that we can agree that the first dog, these are two dogs that we've come into contact at Green Hill with recently. The first dog, Karma, was locked in a storage shed for three weeks after their owners moved away. And it was recovered by the new owners who moved in three weeks later. And the dog was near death, but through good veterinary care and some wonderful folks, he was nursed back to health. They call him Kitch now for kitchen because he can't stay out of it. But the bottom dog, this is Samba. He's a lab type mix. Samba came into Green Hill weighing 195 pounds. That's more than twice what a normal dog his size should weigh. Was that abuse? They loved him. They were feeding him well, giving him anything he wanted, probably lots of treats. In fact, we've been told that he was eating whole chickens and beer, which is what he had a penchant for. But we're in a position to think, like Dr. Kessler was talking about, is that the best home for Samba? They love him, they feed him, they want what's best for him, but the dog's life is being shortened by being this obese for much of it. Samba's been on a diet in our foster care program for quite some time now, and he's now down to about 100 pounds, so that's healthy weight. And he actually had a foster parent who was obese as well, and the foster parent has lost 50 pounds on, <laughs> on the diet as well. So the two of them are very, very happy together. Um, but these are the types of things that that we face. It's not outright. You know, we don't see people beating their dogs. We don't see people who are treating their dogs in those sorts of ways. But we see people who don't know how to properly care for their animals, who haven't been educated about what responsible pet ownership in many ways is. They don't know. You know, they're the people that don't spay and neuter their pets and allow baby animals to come into the world when they can't provide for them. They can't buy them vaccinations or food. They can't find enough homes for them. And then those animals end up in shelters where maybe forever homes come along and, and maybe there aren't enough forever homes for all of them. And so those are the sorts of things we deal with. Recently, we had a dog that was abandoned on our property and she was tied to the gate. And there was a food dish with some food in it. 
in a water bowl with some water in it. So they obviously cared about her. They tied her somewhere where they knew animal lovers would find her, and they gave her food and water. Her name's Blondie. But this dog had a, a broken leg, so she couldn't walk, and she was overdue pregnant, ready to give birth at any moment. So we brought her in, and within 24 hours of being inside our facility, she had eight puppies. And she needed the surgery on her leg, but we couldn't repair it until after she had weaned the puppies and everybody was healthy. Um, so that was a case we dealt with. Is that abuse? They wanted to put her somewhere where she was cared for. They cared enough to leave her food and water, and yet they couldn't adequately take care of that animal. Another little dog, a little Yorkie puppy, six months old, jumped off a table with her family onto concrete, snapped both bones in her front right leg. They waited many, many weeks before seeing about it. They thought, well, it'll heal up. So when she came in, we thought we'd have to amputate that leg. They did bring her to Green Hill. They realized they couldn't take care of her, so they relinquished her to us. And we thought this little six-month puppy whose you know, whole leg is this big, we might have to cut it off because it might not heal. It did. We went in and we repaired it the best we could. And she was casted, had a bright pink cast for a little while. And she's doing much better. She got adopted yesterday. But those are the types of things we deal with. And it's very hard sometimes in those kinds of situations not to be angry at those people, not to wonder why they're not taking better care of their animals. And it's hard to believe that they're doing the best they can, the best they know how to do. So a lot of people ask us when, when animals come in, like Karma and Samba in the newsletter, and we know that they have been mistreated, why don't we press charges? The owner is right there. They're admitting that this is how they've cared for that animal. And usually we don't take any action against them. We could have tracked down Blondie's owners who tied her to the gate. She was wearing a collar, but we didn't. Because we figured that at that point, the animal's much better off because she is in a place where we can take care of her, or he, and we can go on to find them a better situation to be in. And so <coughs> we think that finally, these people, these owners, have done the right thing. Finally, they've tried to, to seek the help that they need. But it's very difficult. We work closely with the Lane County Animal Regulatory Authority, and they have a law enforcement arm where we don't. We don't prosecute anyone. So if we find a dog that's been abandoned um, out in the world somewhere, we bring it into Green Hill, but it can't stay to Green, at Green Hill because we don't take strays. So we always transfer them to Lane County, and they help us out with that. And likewise, when they go on um, uh, cases where abuse is suspected and sometimes can't house all of the animals they find on those cases, they lean on us. And so we'll help them rehabilitate. We'll help house the animals that need us. And so we face a very unique situation in that the people are finally reaching out, and yet you just want to throttle them sometimes, you know? You just want to be like, why are you not taking proper care of this animal? And one of the things that we do in the community to combat that is we do a lot of education. We do a lot of outreach. I visit schools about twice a month. Um, we do a lot of tours. We have kids groups come in and we teach them about the importance of spaying and neutering because spaying and neutering can prevent abuse. You know, animals that are abused are animals sometimes that weren't wanted. And so if we can make few of them, fewer of them, then maybe we could stop that cycle. Maybe people could only have the pets that they want and that they love and cherish and could take care of properly. So we think that's important. We do a lot of outreach when people come in and, like Dr. Kessler was talking about, they don't have the perfect situation for an animal. We have a program called DVAP. It's the Domestic Violence Assistance Program. And when a person has animals, and is in an abusive situation, sometimes they don't want to leave that situation because they're worried about what would happen to the animals. Because there's a really strong tie between people who abuse people and people who abuse animals. Usually one doesn't happen without the other happening as well. So we provide assistance to those people where if they need to relocate, we'll keep their pet for them while they do. And so they drop their dog or cat or rabbit or small animal with us, and we will care for that animal and there are many, many heartbreaking times 
when a month goes by or two months and we're still caring for them or we're not adopting them out, we're just holding them for these people. And we have to have a conversation. There was a woman who came in um, day before yesterday. Her cat's lived with us for four months. It lives in my office. And it's a really sweet cat, but it misses its mom. And I'm not there except eight hours a day. And the woman's living in the Eugene Mission. And she left an abusive situation, but she can't take care of the cat right now. And so we do a lot of outreach about, is it better to relinquish that cat to us and let us find it a new home? You know, is it cruelty to that cat to make it wait in my office with very little companionship for how long until she has a better situation? So those are sort of the things that we deal with. It's, it's a lot more subtle than some of the agencies that have law enforcement arms and get to go out and see the bad guys and, and it's clear cut that these people are doing wrong. A lot of times we have to give people the benefit of the doubt and we have to convince them that leaving their animal with us is the nicest thing they can do, the best thing. Because I don't think that anyone who brings their animal in is thrilled about doing it. But I do, I am grateful every day that they've come to that decision, that finally they've realized that they're moving or they're getting a divorce or they can't adequately care for the animal and that they're willing to keep it out of harm's way to, um, to leave it with us. You guys have seen, I'm sure, on Craigslist. Do you go on Craigslist? I do, every day. You do? <laughs> and there's people rehoming their animals all the time on Craigslist. And we work really hard to combat that. I serve Craigslist and I write to them and say, don't rehome your animal on Craigslist, bring it to us. Because they can't know what's gonna happen to that animal. And I would like to think that everybody who writes for a free dog on Craigslist wants to give that dog a wonderful home and have it for the rest of its life. But unfortunately, sometimes that's not true. And they want them for reasons that aren't nice and reasons that, right, that make you shiver just like that. And uh, so we do a lot of convincing people that sometimes to avoid abuse, to avoid a situation where the animal is suffering, the kindest thing you can do is bring it to a shelter, is bring it to a humane society where the animal um, has the best chance of being cared for properly in the interim and then going on to find a forever home. I need to come visit you. Uh, well, good evening. My name is Mark Wells, and uh, I work for the Oregon Humane Society up in Portland. Um, we're, mis or we're confused with a lot of different humane societies. We're completely independent of any other humane society or SPCA in the nation. We're actually the second oldest humane society in the country. We were started in 1868. Um, and if any of you guys haven't been to our shelter, please come, come by any time. Um, I run the investigations department, and all we do is enforce state animal cruelty crimes and statutes. Um, and I have two investigators, full-time investigators that work for me and, and one support person. I was hired about three years ago, and prior to me getting hired there, we usually only had one, maybe sometimes two uh, investigators on staff just for budgeting. Um, even though we're about 4% of our total shelter budget, um, it's still pretty expensive. So when I was hired, um, it was a, a fun time to actually have three, three staff members. Um, I've been running the department for about two years now. And we're in a really unique position. Uh, it's very unique to Oregon. Um, and we are, I'm paid by the Humane Society. I don't work for the city of Portland, the county of Multnomah, uh, just for the Humane Society. But we're actually commissioned by the governor. There's an old law that allows the governor to commission anybody in the state that he or she wants to to enforce laws that the governor feels are not being enforced adequately. And so for our case, we are commissioned or deputized to investigate and prosecute crimes against animals. Um, so it's a very limited um, kind of commission law enforcement authority. Uh, so there's three of us in Portland. We work uh, primarily in Washington, Multnomah, and, and um, Clackamas County, so the three counties up in Portland. We do have statewide jurisdiction, so uh, we can go anywhere in the state. Uh, because of our caseload, we usually don't leave the area unless uh, we're requested by another law enforcement agency. And the reality is for every 10 requests, I usually turn down every single request. We just don't have the time or staff. To give you guys kind of an idea how busy we are, last year we did about 985 cases. Um, and those are actual field cases where we're actually going out, knocking on somebody's door, or investigating an animal. And to keep in mind, there's only three of us. Um, and also to put things in perspective, we just finished uh, an animal abuse case that I'll talk about a little bit 
Um, that one case took one of my investigators, Austin, out of the field for about three and a half weeks for one case. And that was doing all the investigation, writing the search warrant, executing the search warrant, all the evidence prep, writing the case. And Austin's actually on vacation now, and I've got 55 of his cases sitting on my desk that we haven't touched. Um, we're constantly in a state of triage. The cases come in 10, 15, 20 a day. Um, we're going through them, screening them out, which ones sound the worst, which ones can we basically put on a shelf until later. Um, we're swamped. We've been that way ever since I've been there. Um, there's only two other agents like us down with the Redmond Humane Society. Um, Josh runs that department. He got commissioned about two years ago, and they just had a new investigator commissioned about a year ago. So for the entire state of Oregon, uh, we have five humane agents. Um, not enough. And, and we sure want a whole lot more. It's tricky, too, because uh, in my three years, uh, our commission cycle lasts for two years. The governor basically uh, signs our commission cards. Um, that gives us our authority to do what we do. Um, in my three years, I've almost lost my job twice. Uh, we just re-signed our contract um, and almost lost our job again. Uh, our commission expired September 30th, and we actually just got our new commission today. actually just came in the mail. Um, so it, it's pretty challenging for us. We're, we're filling a void that regular law enforcement simply just cannot, cannot fill. Um, I was a police officer in Sherwood, Oregon, a small town south of Portland before I came here. Um, and you know, I came from a municipal police department where I can tell firsthand that local police departments uh, just don't have the staff to in investigate these crimes. Um, even though I was a police officer, I didn't know this, that there's a law in Oregon that says uh, any peace officer, which is a police officer, sheriff's deputy, anybody that has arrest authority is required in the state of Oregon to enforce animal cruelty laws um, just like they would any other crime. Um, it's actually a law. So two things. One, I never knew that, so they certainly don't teach that very well in the academy. Um, and second of all, uh, we really shouldn't be doing this, if you think about it. Our regular constituted police should be doing this. They're required to by law. Um, in the city of Portland, they've got, I think, 85 openings in their police department. If you call and say there's a guy outside uh, or there's a dog outside starving, it's really thin, uh, they will not send a police officer out. They will send a police officer out only if an animal, usually a dog, is actively attacking somebody. Um, and they just simply can't do it. I have a lot of friends that are cops there. Um, they're so short-staffed they can barely keep up with the 911 calls. So um, there's a huge void in the state. There's a, a definite need for it. There's also a huge reluctance um, at the state legislature le level, in the governor's office, um, to really identify and embrace this concept of humane law enforcement. Um, if you go down to California, they have what's called a, a state humane officer position. They're almost exclusively employed by humane societies and SPCAs. They've been doing that for 30 or 40 years. Our director, Sharon Harmon, started her career as a, up in Marin County um, as a state humane officer. They go through the regular police academy. They're fully sworn police officers. Um, and it's ironic that you go to one state south of us and they have all, you go like the, the Los Angeles SPA has a small police department. Um, they've embraced that concept. They've done that for decades. Um, but yet you come to Oregon and we're basically hanging on with our fingernails to keep our commission. Uh, we've tried to mimic uh, California's law twice now, uh, and actually that was part of my job. This last leg legislative session, uh, we proposed a bill with Senate Bill 406 to basically mimic California. We'd be Oregon State Humane Agents. Um, even though we're currently required to go through the regular police academy, we're not certified as humane officers, um, and that's what that legislation would do. It's failed two times. Um, and we were actually out lobbied by everybody from the Cattlemen's Association to the Farm Bureau to um, everybody. It was, it was tough. So um, it's frustrating for me personally because I see it every day. I see the need for it. Um, I could easily keep 10 investigators busy uh, 40 hours a week just in those three counties. Um, and we're, we're slowly trying to get the funding and the budgets to add as many as we can. Um, but what also is frustrating is that for some reason, um, Oregon, in my opinion, yeah, is decades behind a lot of other states. They haven't embraced this concept of humane law enforcement. Um, in the current police academy, it's a 400-hour academy. Two hours is humane law enforcement, animal crimes, even though I probably enforce anywhere from 20 to 30 different, different crimes. Um, of course, Oregon has the second shortest police academy in the nation, so you, know, you put it all in, in, in perspective. Um, the big thing that I get on my soapbox is, um, out of those 1,000 cases, um, we probably on a, on a weekly basis deal with child neglect, abuse, elderly neglect and abuse, um, manufacturing, distribution of drugs, narcotics, 
Um, we see so many other crimes that are associated with animal neglect, abuse, and abandonment. Um, it's a real eye-opener to me. I did see it as a police officer. I'd go to domestic violence calls, um, and there would be abuse in the house, and there would be a dog chained up in the backyard. Um, I'll be honest, at the time, I didn't really correlate, put the two together. But it, it's been a real eye-opener. We'll go out on a simple call, skinny cat in the front yard. Turns out um, there's domestic violence going on in the house. Um, there's all kinds of different things going on. That'll start with a very simple, you know, bottom of the barrel, C misdemeanor crime. Uh, we've had cases go all the way up to, to felony assault, felony domestic violence, child abuse, neglect. We had a case about three months ago, an um, uh, 85-year-old man was living in his house. His son moved back in um, and basically stole all of his dad's benefits, his uh, retirement, his Social Security. Uh, his house was already paid for. He put about $150,000 from a gambling addiction on the house. Um, and the, his father, the, the older gentleman, loved cats. So our call was you know, a bunch of cats running around the yard. Some of them looked kind of sick. Um, when Austin, my investigator, got there, he knocked on the door. Nobody answered, and he could hear this old man kind of moaning. And he looked through the window, and the guy was just sitting right there on the couch. Um, we came back the next day, got consent to go in the house. The son was home. And uh, this older gentleman had been basically stuck on this couch, uh, rotting away. He wasn't being fed. Uh, he was in a diaper that hadn't been changed in weeks. Um, it was severe elderly abuse and neglect. Uh, we actually got him removed from the house, um, and um, a lot of other crimes are being associated with that. A lot of that was handed off to Portland police, and he's being prosecuted for that. Um, another case that we just did um, last week, we served a search warrant in southeast Portland. The case that we had was a, a young couple. She's our suspect's 22. Um, a, a person in the area had witnessed her going out every day for about 20 or 30 minutes. She had two dogs, and she'd only for some reason pick on the female dog. And for about 20 minutes, she would kick, punch, slap, and step on the dog. And half the time she did this, she was holding her 10-month-old baby. Um, so on that one search warrant, we removed the dog, um, which was a good animal abuse case. Um, but we also had the child successfully removed with, uh, with Department of Human Services. Um, so it's, it's, it's there every day. We see it all the time. We have people that have mental illness problems addiction problems, uh, they are criminals in the truest sense of the, of the word, and they also choose to own animals. Um, so it, there's a need for that. There's a need to embrace that, that concept that you need to have professionally trained, sworn peace officers investigating these crimes um, and, and to take it really serious. Um, Austin, who came from New Hampshire, he worked for a police department, and within the police department they had a sworn animal control officer position. Um, and it's very rare. You go to some counties in Oregon, especially in, in northeastern Oregon, there's absolutely no animal control at all. So unless you can get your overworked and underpaid police department or sheriff's department to send somebody out, you have absolutely no recourse for an animal crime. Um, and I deal with calls from all over Oregon, people that are frustrated. Um, you know, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to report the crimes. There's no shelter. There's no humane society. There's no animal control officer. There's nothing. Um, so one of my big soapbox things is, you know, people call and they're irate and they're upset and they don't like the law. And I tell people simply, well, then you need to get involved. You need to go to your county, you know, your, your commissioner meeting, your city town hall meeting. You need to go down, talk to your legislature that's down in Salem, change the laws and, and find the funding and, and change these things because nothing's going to change unless, unless people get involved. Um, the law in itself, um, I was actually quoted in, I think it was the Baker City Tribune, I can't remember the uh, the publication, um, I said, uh, Oregon's animal laws, then it was hyphen, basically it stinks. That's what I said. Uh, my <laughs> boss wasn't too happy about that. Um, but it's true. The, the law is, is it's, it's a little bit more progressive than some states, but for a police officer or an animal control officer to successfully uh, work an animal crime, you have to jump through a lot of, loop, a lot of hoops. Um, and it can be very, very challenging. Another thing, too, is we've had a lot of cases. We worked a case with Hillsborough Police Department. It was the Miriam Sackowitz bunny case, if anybody heard about it. Um, it's probably one of the largest, uh, as far as number of animals, uh, neglect case in the state's history. We seized 165 rabbits and 88 dead rabbits on this woman's property. She was a, an animal hoarder. Um, it's a mental disease. Um, it's, it's, it's recently been recognized in the mental health world. Uh, it's still relatively new. 
Um, so it's a mental illness and it's also a crime. People think that they're rescuing these animals. They have the reluctance to take them to a humane society or a county shelter. And uh, our suspect, uh, Ms. Sackowitz, basically felt that she was taking care of these rabbits. And what the rabbits were doing is when you overcrowd rabbits, they, they eat each other, they cannibalize each other. And uh, we had dozens and dozens of rabbits that were missing everything from ears to uh, all kinds of things. It was, it was not good. But what's interesting with that case is it was a joint case. Actually, Hillsborough did a phenomenal job. They took the case on. They actually asked us to take the case, and we couldn't. We were just too busy. Um, so they did a really good job. A lot of police departments would have been not been very eager to take on a case like that. But we seized all those rabbits. Uh, we moved them all to a secure evidence facility with the police department. Um, and because of the, the law as it's currently written, um, we had to feed and maintain. It ended up being 210 rabbits for almost eight and a half months. Um, the, it's called a forfeiture process that when you seize an animal, um, a law enforcement agency can be stuck caring for those animals for years. And that's another thing that we're working on changing. Um, there's some states where, uh, in Colorado and Arizona, we're actually working with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. We have a kind of a, a joint task force with them. We're trying to mirror some of those laws. If you seize an animal, as long as you have a, a you know, you lawfully seize the animal with a search warrant, um, you have, the owner has 10 days to post a bond. If they fail to post that bond, basically a dollar amount to pay for the care of that animal and the continued care through the trial, um, they lose ownership of the animal. Um, and I deal with a lot of police chiefs and a lot of sheriffs around the state that say, you know, yes, I've got 20 horses out in that field that are dying, but if I seize those horses, I'm going to have to lay off one of my patrol officers. I can't afford two to three thousand dollars a week to, to rehabilitate these horses. So they have to make a decision. Do I seize 20 horses? Or do I have a 15, 20 minute delay for somebody that's, that's being attacked on the street and you can't respond to a 911 call? Um, it really is that bad in some parts of our state, and it shouldn't be. Um, and that's why that's some, one of the things that the Oregon Humane Society is working on is, is trying to change the law to give law enforcement the tools they, they need to do their job. Um, and as long as you follow due process and you don't violate someone's rights, um, th there needs to be a quicker adjudication for that, for that evidence, which is animals. Um, so um, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, I'm, I'm your homegrown here. Uh, I came into Oregon about eight years ago. And here again, I was also in law enforcement. I was a sheriff's deputy uh, down in the state of Nevada. And eight years ago, I had to make a decision because I also ran their animal control agency and the sheriff said, hey, I need you full-time deputy or I need you full-time animal control. He says, I want you to go with, with uh, being a deputy, continue to being a deputy because I was working double shifts. And so I was offered the position up here to come up here. So my decision was, do I go after those that can do for themselves or do I go after those that can't do for themselves? And that's why I chose this profession. I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, when we talk about cruelty and abuse, uh, domestic violence in, within the home, that's called the, the circle of violence. Anytime that we go into a situation, uh, one case that I can tell you about is we went in uh, on neglect. We ended up bringing in child services to take children. I mean, you walked into this place you'd fall through the floor because of the urine and the feces from all the animals and the kids and everything the mom didn't mind taking the kids but when we went to take the animals she went berserk and this is not uncommon the people will let you take their kids they'll let you take their husband they'll let you take their wife anything but don't touch the animals they get violent so you know, in that particular case, we ended up taking all the animals and the kids, and she went to jail. But um, I did bring you a visual. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you that, you know, this is a national problem. Animal cruelty is a national problem. And it was created by a generation that felt that it's a throwaway generation, where it isn't. We throw away pop bottles. We threw away everything in my generation, and I'm sorry to say that I was part of that generation. So animals were no different. Now a new generation has come up. 
which is fantastic. They've realized we cannot do this. And unfortunately, my generation has ended up doing things like this to animals. And it happens here, trust me, in Lane County, um, not only nationally. But I'm going to show you uh, this little pug here that we had. And I'm not sure if that's your facility or not. But as you can see on the back, he has a, a large tumor, a large growth, that the owner just felt, so what? It's not hurting him. Well, how do you know? You know, did you take it to a vet? No. So actually, he, he turned out all right. He was, he was a pretty good little dog. And then the next one, and these are progressively going to get worse, OK? This one here, the owner didn't, we didn't even realize. When we impounded the dog, we knew it was kind of so-so, you know. But then when we started examining it and everything else, we found the collar of the dog had been embedded into the neck. And here again, we did not know who the owner was. These will get very graphic. So if you have a, a weak stomach, please do not look at them because it is reality. This is what we deal with in Lane County. Uh, go ahead with the next one. Now this, this is very common in Oregon. It was never common in Nevada, but I found that it's very common up here with, with a lot of animals, even horses, uh, with rain rot. But obviously, he's got a, a flea allergy or a skin allergy or something that needs veterinary care. Now these are, that's a moderate uh, neglect case for us. We wouldn't prosecute it criminally. Um, it'd be administratively. And they'd still be held accountable for what they've done. Go ahead. There we go. Nice little kitty, upper respiratory. I'll bet my colleague down there can tell you everything that's wrong with that cat just by that picture. <laughs> but the thing is, we, we deal with these people, and like we were talking about with hoarders and, and collectors and things, that cat's healthy. I'm taking good care of that cat. And you're telling them, look at it. You know, we had a case in uh, Florence, actually, the first year I was here with a gentleman that had, we ended up seizing 100 cats, live cats, out of his home where the ceiling was falling in because just all the, the wetness and the moisture and everything. And he had about 60 in Tupperware containers that had died. And his thing was he wanted to have his own cemetery. He, he loved his animals. Now, it, is he a criminal? No. Is he mentally unstable? Yes. So our agency has been progressive and progressive and progressive to get these people help. You know, we'll go ahead and, and slap them with the, uh, uh, we got them with probation and everything, but part of the court order is that he seeks mental health counseling. Um, this is very common upper respiratory all over the county, all over the nation actually. Okay, go with the next one. This one uh, was probably one of the worst ones that one of my officers went out on, and he's a 30-year veteran. The owner of this animal, and that's just horrid, the owner of this animal left for two weeks for a vacation, thought her mom was coming in to take care of the dogs. Nobody had been there for over two weeks. There's actually two dogs in that kennel. The other one had to be, was eaten by the one that's alive. Just to, just to, just to live. There was another dog in the residence that was, it was fairly okay because it had the run of the house. It could drink water out of the toilet. There was a big bag of dog food there. This woman's pleading not guilty to animal cruelty. How can you look at that and say you're not guilty of animal cruelty? It just astounds me. This is the dog once we got it out of the cage. And uh, it's actually made a pretty good recovery, I think. And it's hard for me to follow every cases that we have because we do so many. And I try and get with all my officers on these. Uh, this one is actually going to be going to court very shortly. Go ahead. Yeah, we do large animals. And unfortunately, in uh, Lane County, our authorization 
when we deal with large animals is only neglect and abuse. It's not livestock at large or anything like that. It's specifically neglect and abuse when we deal with them. That horse really isn't too bad compared to some of them I've seen. I've seen some just walking skeletons that could barely even walk. And those that couldn't walk, and we couldn't even get them up, and they had to be euthanized. Um, that's a donkey, of course. <laughs> but he had a hard time walking. Now, this case here, I believe, was the one that uh, was out in Junction City a few years back where we went out and seized 35 animals and they were all horses. And what happened there was that the mom and the daughters decided, hey, we're gonna raise horses and sell them. Well, the daughters lost interest, mom got older and older, everybody moved out and left mom there. She didn't wanna call us because she was embarrassed. Is she a criminal? Not really. So we dealt with her. We seized all the animals, but we dealt with her that, uh, the way that would fit the crime. Punishment fit the crime. She was another one, five years probation, where we had a no-knock, where we could walk in at any time. Uh, I don't, that's not Buttons, though. This no. is one of the other horses that came off. This is Buttons. There's Buttons. <laughs> Buttons was also within those ones that, uh, within the 35 that we seized on my birthday. <laughs> and uh, three different veterinarians said that horse needed to be put down. And it was so heartbreaking because that horse was actually a $10,000 show horse at one time. We knew the prior owner. Buttons would lay out in that field. We would haul water out to him or out to her and feed and everything till finally we got her up, we got her moving, we had x-rays done, she had inflammation all the way up into her legs and that's why the veterinarians were telling us to, that we should probably euthanize her. Well, the safe place where I held all the animals, a very good friend of mine, she said, I can't do it. I won't let you do it, I will do anything so I talked to the vets, I said, okay, is, is the animal suffering? Well, of course the animal's suffering. So they went ahead with, with painkillers and everything else, and lo and behold, look what happened to Buttons. Man, Buttons even has a foal now. So there are miracles. We went back in, took x-rays again, and they could not find the inflammation up into the bones anymore. That woman there, uh, poured her heart and soul into getting that horse back up. So it was a beautiful, beautiful horse. And then, the way that we feel, that's uh, pretty dark. <laughs> the way that we feel that we're going to be able to change things is right there. That's Troop 40, Junior Girl Scouts, came out, took a look at the place, came back, they made 100 kitty bags that go with adoptions. They really took an interest in what we do. Those folks there, those young people there, and you people are the ones that are really going to see the difference that we're trying to make now, and I know you're gonna continue to do it. Um, you run across things like this, you've heard from the entire panel. Uh, we all have our own nooks and crannies. Uh, mine's enforcement, his is enforcement. Uh, we do run a shelter, and on the enforcement side, uh, which I think more shelters are going to, is that we have a, uh, um, agreements like with Oregon Humane Society with their shelter, a lot of the shelters throughout the state where we're transferring animals rather than euthanizing. And we've been doing this for, well, since I've been there, past eight years. We have built up that, that uh, partnership with, with a lot of different people so this doesn't happen. It allows us actually to spend more time in the field going after people that do things like this to animals. And if you see somebody that is cruel to an animal or you even suspect, don't hesitate to call my office. You do not, and this is the only time that we take any anonymous calls, is neglect and abuse on an animal. You don't have to tell us your name. Just tell us where it's at. And we will go out and we will try and prosecute them. 
I run across in our county uh, cockfighters, pit bull fighters. Um, it's horrendous, and it, and it does need to stop. There has been a, a pretty good change. We last year we had uh, contact, and these are initial contacts in Lane County, uh, with three, five officers, three three and a half in the city of Eugene and one and a half in the county. Uh, we made first contacts with over 6,000 people last year alone. So it's happening out there. And that was from one thing or another, from dog at large, clearing the cruelty. And it is very expensive. And luckily, with the 35 horses there, uh, yeah, there is no way that we could have paid that out of our budget. But the good people in this community when we put that story out there, it was the people in the community that came forward. They paid all the vet bills. They paid all the board bills. Uh, they came in. They adopted all the horses. And uh, so it was so heartwarming when that comes out in this community that it really didn't cost us anything. We got our money back. Of course, we had to pay for it. But this is what happens in neglect and, and abuse situations is the people don't have the money to pay for it. You know, they're running the meth lab, but they can't license their dog, or they can't take care of them. So if, in fact, anything within this county is, is not right, if you don't think something's right with their animals, let us know, and we'll be out there and we'll take a look at it. It's one of our highest priorities, because we, too, are very short-staffed, and we deal with a lot of things. We, we help out all lo uh, local law enforcement, sheriff's department, Junction City PD, whoever calls us up. And uh, we will actually go out there because, like you said, in post, they don't train you in animal law. They don't train you on what to do with animals. They train you about people. So they call us in because we know what we're doing with animals and, and prosecution on animals. So. But I'd like to thank everybody. You haven't had to talk yet. Mm -hmm. These two at the end have worked relentless uh, for the animals of this county, and along with my staff. And I know if I called up to Oregon Humane and told them I had a pit bull fighting ring down here, they'd be down here in a hot second, you know. So we work as a team. But the main part of the team, I, I believe, is the public. And the public needs to let us know and they need to get out there and educate and spread the word that we're not going to stand for it. That's all I have. I have enjoyed hearing all these hardworking people. Um, I'm just going to, since I'm so short back there, I just feel like I should just come up here. Um, I'm Carrie. I am a student here at Oregon. I am a co-director of our animal rights group. I'm sorry, I'm turning my back to you guys. Um, um, and so I'm going to kind of broaden the scope of the talk a little bit. And I'm not really going to talk about specific cruelty um, and the details of that. Um, although that's what the pictures we've seen and the handouts that I have from our animal rights group that's in that little crate over there. Um, what I wanted to do, to me, those are just the, those are the symptoms of a larger problem. So I wanted to talk about the root problem which really is our image of ourselves as humans in relation to other animals in the world. So this is kind of getting into um, a more of a philosophical topic about rights. And um, so and what I'm going to do is ask some questions sometimes of you guys, and you guys can just yell out some short answers, um, and that'll kind of guide our discussion. So our, for my first question I have is, why do we care about the welfare of other animals? Because we're all interdependent. Okay, because we're all interdependent. Is that like an ecology? Kind of? Okay, because you can, yeah, you can take it like an ecology standpoint, like we actually all are to have to yeah. rely on each other. Yeah. Yeah, even with plants and, and trees and all kinds of life, there is an inter interdependence. That's good. What are some other reasons we care about the welfare of other animals? Okay. They appeal to us and, and they like sentimental ways, right? They're like babies. Yeah. Yeah. Because they like they care about folks a lot of times. They can't really we have we can exert more power over them. So Okay. So we feel maybe like they're victims or they're helpless. Okay. Um 
do we feel like they can suffer or they feel things? Is that part of why we care about them? Okay. I think so, yeah. And that's part of then why we're, we're uh, you know, sad when we see them, you know, in a situation like, what, you know, so what we've seen up here. Because, um, yeah, we feel like, okay, they feel things too, just like we do, which, of course, makes sense because we're all animals, so it's, you know, not rocket science to think <laughs> that, you know, they're going to feel this, a lot of the same things that we do. Um, why do we care about the welfare of other humans? of them are. <laughs> yeah, so a certain level of empathy and connection that comes from feeling like you, you can empathize because you recognize that you both have the ability to feel. Okay, I think that's an excellent answer. Any other reasons why we care about the welfare of other humans? Yeah, it's legally, we kind of have to now, right? But, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I don't think a lot of us disagree with it, or, you know, but yeah, that is, we are at this point, you know, that's part of our socialization, is that that human life is precious. You can't put a, you know, a, a price on it. And so we're kind of told this. And certainly, you know, non-human life is not quite as precious, and you can put a price on it. So we've kind of been brought up that way, and a lot of times we really haven't questioned it. But I think one of the things that, the answers to both those questions, one of the things that there was a connection there was that uh, we care about the welfare of anybody because they have the ability to feel. And so actually a lot of the animal rights philosophers have kind of made an argument that uh, about extending out rights to other animals based on the fact that, um, okay, yeah, they're not human, but so what if they're not human? <laughs> um, they also have the ability to feel their individuals with personalities and they are conscious subjects of a life who want to keep living. So, like a lot of the different philosophers, kind of come up with different terms for it, whether it's sentience or consciousness. But it's it's really like the idea of being an individual, being a person. And they've actually kind of argued that we tend to think that one of the reasons that we you know care so much about other humans, maybe more than other animals, is oh because we're so smart. And I think you know that's true. We do have great ability to do abstract and symbolic thought. But just because my cat, you know, doesn't know the alphabet, you know, that doesn't make me, you know, feel like she deserves a whole lot less. Who cares? Because also some humans will never in their lifetime be able to have a high level of abstract thinking. Because not all humans have the same level of intelligence. So, you know, a lot of times even though we think it's rationality is the reason why we, we care about other humans, I, you know, the, a lot of philosophers have argued, no, it's actually because we care about them because they have an ability to feel and suffer and they have a right you know, to their life no matter what their intelligence level is. Um, let me kind of change the, the angle a little bit. Why have we historically denied rights to some other humans? Okay, power because we want power. Right, it's always gonna be, yeah, a group that I'm not in, right? Okay. And sometimes it's not even the majority, but um, but that certainly helps as far as might makes right is concerned. But yeah, feeling like, yeah, I'm in a more powerful position, maybe a power in numbers than this group, so that it's easier to marginalize them. Um, and I think a lot of times it is because ultimately, like we can say, oh, well, it's discrimination and, and those kinds of things, and it is. And But I think the root of it is often what, what you were kind of getting at, which is a power dynamic that um, that you want to have the ability to exploit somebody else and you want to be able to justify it. So that's what we've done with women and people of color and um, lots of other categories of people in, in across the world, but also in the United States. Okay? Um, so ultimately, we're wanting to retain power to exploit them. So why do we continue to deny rights to other animals, do you think? And when I say rights, I don't mean like the right to vote. I mean like right as in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like why do we then deny that right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness to other animals? More like for freedom from so like that, 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 that,
is it to a, like to be a more responsible pet owner yourself to allow more freedom to the dog so you're more aware of his feelings and the right way to kind of take care of him? Yeah, and actually I'm going to get into that concept of breeding and taking care of them. Because, yeah, you don't want to be irresponsible as far as if someone can't take care of themselves. Like, you wouldn't do that to a baby. You wouldn't just go, oh, you should be free, you're a human. You know, so it's not quite like that. Um, but there are complications with, with some domestication. But, um, yeah. Well, I think money a lot of times is an issue because, mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about cage-free eggs and, you know, chickens who they have them all cooped up and having, you know, all the different, like, drugs put into them and stuff, and it's all about money. They want mm -hmm. them to just, you know, they want as many as they can or a little space as they can to get as many eggs as they can in order to make as much money yeah. as they can. Yeah, so it's not really about, a lot of times when you're denying somebody rights, it's not about maybe trying to be mean as much as it is maybe being selfish and wanting to profit off the fact that you can because somebody then can be used as a tool. So in both of those cases, whether it's a human or whether it's a, a non-human animal, um, the situation with rights is about um, if you don't extend them rights, that gives you the justification to exploit and use them. And that allows us to use them as a tool and to sacrifice their major interests, like their life, for the sake of um, serving our minor interests, like maybe our appetite or something like that. Um, so that kind of gets to one of the tenets of animal rights is that we should not view other animals as resources because that's what, how we try not to view other people. Although, you know, certainly there's times when we view each other um, in a utilitarian kind of way. But ultimately, our laws are there to protect us from being used and exploited. So that's really what animal rights is also asking for, is that we value other animal beings as inherently valuable individuals and not just instrumentally, like I value them only based on what they can do for me. Because that's, that's pretty much what is going on right now. But in both cases, um, it's about wanting inherent value for those individuals. Um, and one of the things, to get back to what you were saying before, is a lot of an animal rights philosophy, philosophy would be about freedom for animals, so a, as much as possible for them not to be dependent on us or dominated by us or within our control. Now, um, I, you know, I have a cat, actually, here she is, <laughs> and we've been friends for 14 years um, and roommates, um, and, you know, and I feel like there's not much I can do. She was born, it, I wasn't involved in that process, but someone gave her to me as a gift for graduation, which is not a good idea, but anyway. Um, so <laughs> my college graduation from undergrad, this is what I got. Um, and so, well, I forgot my point. Whenever I think about her, she's so adorable. Um, let's see. Um, just that, oh, well, it would be irresponsible of me, I feel like, to kind of say, well, be free when she doesn't know how to catch her own food and everything at this point. But I do believe, and this is more of an animal rights philosophy, that breeding of domesticated animals then becomes an issue. If we actually actively breed animals who are going to be dependent on us, we're constantly putting them at a disadvantage. Now, that doesn't mean that some of them won't be treated fabulously on our homes, but I think that that's a minority of them. And we can't always control what will happen to those animals. But it still is an idea that we're in charge. So I think that animal rights believes if there's animals out there that are domesticated or dependent, let's try to take care of them as best as we can, but let's not breed other animals who are basically going to be perpetual juveniles and not have the dignity of being kind of free adult individuals like um, wildlife has the opportunity to be. Um, and also they're always dependent on our whims and our needs. Like we also breed them to fit what we want, right? We breed them to be cute, you know, certain dogs even if they can't breathe, well, or we breed now farmed animals to be really kind of fat and obese, even if it causes their legs to crush under their weight. It doesn't really matter. We're breeding them to fit our needs. So this gets into some legal issues um, because legally there are property. And um, so they don't really have clearly as much protection as humans. And you can see from the struggle that these people have talked about, there's even no funding for whatever laws we do have. That, you know, There's very little protection for these animals. Um, and what protection they have is not always the same as well um, because it depends also how we protect them depends on how useful they are to us. Um, and a lot of times the penalties 
for cruelty are to individuals, but not to industries. For example, if I decided to burn my cat just because I was interested in experimenting on her or for I got mad, I'm going to have you know, one of them come after me, rightly so, right? But if I'm in a lab, you put a white, I'm going to have a doctorate soon, you put a white coat on me, I could burn a cat in a lab and then that's okay because it's for human, it's for some kind of human purpose. So it's not considered cruelty, it's not considered unnecessary. Same thing if, I, if there's a rabbit, if I decide to shoot the rabbit or eat the rabbit, um, as an individual, I'm going to get put in jail. Um, but it, you know, if that's done on a farm or with a hunting license in the wild, then that's okay. So we have actually kind of schizophrenic laws, but they are rooted in the idea that if it doesn't benefit humans directly, then it's considered cruel. But an animal rights philosophy also says that, you, you know, it's not okay just to use somebody if, if there's a benefit to humans. The concept is it's not okay to use somebody, period. So it's not okay to experiment on someone who's not willing to be experimented on just because you think it might benefit some humans. Um, and let me ask you while we're talking about the law, do, do you think the most frequently exploited animal species have the most legal protection? Or do the most frequently exploited animals have the least legal protection? Yeah, least. And I, you know, maybe somebody could find examples of where that's not true, but I'm thinking in general about, like, for example, chickens and mice, because chickens are the animal that we kill the most um, in the United States and we use them for food, but they're excluded from one of the only two federal laws we have to protect farmed animals, the Humane Slaughter Act. So really they can be thrown in a wood chipper to kill them, and some of them are. Um, so, you know, it, you can see where money enters into this. And as well, like when you think of laboratory animals, you usually think of mice. Well, guess, guess who is excluded from the Animal Welfare Act, which is one of the only things that governs the treatment of animals in labs. Uh, mice and some other animals are excluded. Um, so th what laws we do have often don't protect the animals maybe who need it most um, because there are economic reasons um, why those animals have no protection. It doesn't actually make sense beyond an economic reason. Um, and farmed animals have some of the least protection. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, what percent of all animals killed in the United States do you think are farmed animals? All the animals we kill, like from euthanasia, from not having homes, and from hunting and labs, what percent of those animals that we kill are farmed animals? 65, 90, 90, 30. 90. It's actually 98%. And actually, that's only the ones that are land animals that are you know, going through our USDA slaughterhouses. That's not all the animals who are um, caught from the sea. So that would probably make it 99 point something. So for those of us who are concerned about animals, actually, if you want to put your <laughs> efforts into some place where there's a lot of animals that need it, um, it's these animals that are being farmed. Um, and because they have very little protection, the Humane Slaughter Act, and there's a Transportation Act, um, which was from like 100 years ago or something, um, that are the only things that protect farmed animals, because a lot of state anti-cruelty statutes um, specifically exclude farmed animals. So, and again, that's done for economic reasons. Um, and so, I mean, I would be pretty upset if one of the only things that was governing um, laws about me was called Humane Slaughter Act. You know, like, that's not good. If, <laughs> like, that's, that's it. That's all you got is Humane Slaughter Act. Um, but, so one of the things I kind of wanted to wrap up with was the idea that th animals are being treated cru cruelly, and certainly you can look at the vegetarian literature and see how the farmed animals are being treated, but I decided not to kind of talk about those specifics because I don't really think it matters exactly how they're treated. It's going to be disgusting and it's going to be miserable because people are trying to make money off of it. Um, but the point is not to give these enslaved animals um, a less inhumane life while we exploit them. I think the point is not to exploit them in the first place. So that's the difference between animal welfare and animal rights is usually like, do we, are we working to try to, you know, get bigger cages? Or are we trying to free them from being exploited and not have any cages? So those, that's the basic difference. And so I just wanted to, you know, invite any of you to join our student animal rights group because um, 
I'm a co-director, but I'm graduating, and um, there's a lot of things that you could do on this campus with, um, you know, the, all the animals that are being served, you know, in our dining services, <laughs> factory farmed animals, and the animals in laboratories here. Or you could also get involved, you know, through our group, and one of the things you could do is also work with some of these local shelters as well, or and try to get them more of the funding that they need. There's all kinds of things that you can do, but certainly animals need a lot of help. So I had passed around um, a little board, so I would love for you to get involved and for you to be taking my place next year. That would be awesome. So thank you guys for coming here. And we got started a bit late tonight, and I want to make sure that we have a chance for all of you to ask some questions. So uh, if you need to depart, that's fine. We completely understand. But for those of you that have some questions, we want to make sure we have a chance for that. Feel free to, to address a specific panelist or if you have a general question for anyone on the panel. I'm going to pass this around, and we'll, maybe we'll take at least 10 minutes to make sure that we have all, any questions answered that are in the audience. So. Uh, I was just curious. You're talking about uh, farmed animals, right? and the exploitation that happens to them. Uh, for those of us that are carnivores and do enjoy kind of meat and that kind of stuff, how would you propose a non, uh, an alternative to the exploitation? So a non, so how can we not exploit them and still eat them? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. And I was like, oh, how can I do it? You know, um, because I was growing, you know, I liked it. But um, I just kind of came to the conclusion, like, I can't kill anybody when it's not like some desperate struggle for my life, you know. And I'm so, and I'm not going to pay someone else to do it either. And also, like, I wouldn't, we wouldn't kind of be worried about, you know, the treatment of humans if they were being killed. Like, we wouldn't worry, like, oh, is there a way we can treat them a little better before we kill them? So. The answer, I don't think there is a way through farmed animals that we can do that. And so that's why I don't really promote humane products. To me, they're still cruelty. But it, sometimes that might be, it is a step in the better direction for easing our guilt, but it doesn't change our basic attitude of superiority over others. Um, it's a little bit different if you were out in a situation where you, you know, didn't have access to any food and you were in the woods and then you had to kill somebody else to survive, um, then that becomes more of a natural predation process. But I don't personally think the process of enslaving and breeding somebody to be used, they're whole, like that's slavery. And I don't care whether you treat them nicely before you kill them. Um, I, I've just come to the conclusion that that does not, um, there really isn't a way to do that that makes sense with an animal rights law. Okay, well just to respond to your question, um, one of the um, struggles that I've kind of come to was um, I'm vegetarian, I guess not ve really vegetarian, but I don't eat meat when I'm here. Um, but I think that there are ways that you can at least be a little bit nicer if you choose to eat meat. Um, I usually, if I buy meat or if I go to a restaurant, I make sure that it's Oregon country beef and the people that serve this food um, those animals are treated better. They're not kept in cages. They're able, it's range free, so they can roam and feed as they please. Um, a lot of the animals are kept in cages, which, you know, distort their claws. Um, some of the meat, as far as like cows, there's different grades, and some of them are kept, they're not allowed to walk at all throughout their entire life. And um, they're kept in a little, area and they get massaged and that's about it because that helps the, the tenderness of the meat. And so um, if you buy Oregon country beef and there's other kinds of chicken too that you can buy that is range free also. But um, they basically it's hormone free, um, range free and so they treat the cows a lot better before they are killed. So it's a good alternative. And some restaurants that offer this meat um, mm -hmm. <laughs> is uh, McMinimins. And um, Burgerville, we don't have any around any around here, but so yeah. Just a real quick side note on that. Our our bill that I talked about, our humane agent bill that would mirror California and give us really the authority and the and the, the defined peace officer status that we really need. Um, our biggest opposition was the Oregon Cattlemen's Association and the Oregon Farm Bureau. Um, they have two huge lobby groups mm -hmm. and they have the legislators ear. Uh, they contribute hundreds of thousands of dollars to their campaigns. 
Um, and I, I'm not going to, you know, I, I look at it that, and the ironic part is we do not investigate commercial livestock operations. Um, I've, I've had multiple complaints on huge cattle, you know, dairy places, and, and, and we refer those to the, the State Department of Ag. We, you know, we, we specialize in domestic pets. We do do livestock. Those are owned, like horses that people own, not for commercial gain. Um, and it's ironic that we, we refer all of our commercial livestock investigations to the State Department of Agriculture. Um, but yet our biggest opposition, the people saying we don't want basically for us to continue having our job, were, the, were those types of, of groups. So is it related or not? It's not my place to say, but I think it's an interesting part to the whole, the whole discussion. Um, my question is actually about college campuses and college students who adopt pets or find pets and then they graduate and suddenly mm -hmm. there's no place for them. So um, I don't know who would know most about this because I think that you guys probably all have college campuses near you. I know that half of you do. Um, so does that happen a lot? Um, do you find that a lot of the animals that you're rescuing are kind of from, you know, the, I guess, the house it, down it the street? Used to be. It used to be that way. Um, in fact, there's even codes written into the, in Lane County that uh, there's certain areas around the college that you can't own an animal and you're not allowed to have one. Years back, uh, that's exactly what happened is they were adopting animals or they were finding cats or whatever and when you graduated they just left them and then it ended up with our agency having to come in and collect them all. But there is also a group, um, and it slips my mind right now, but they offer any students that happen to have an animal when they graduate, just <laughs> happen to have one, they offer to go ahead and, and take that animal and find homes. So for the past three years, we have actually not had to respond out here at all to pick yeah. up any abandoned animals. And between that group and, and the students, I think that's just fantastic. It's been it's been great. It's like the country fair. <laughs> we used to have a lot of trouble at the country fair. We haven't been out there in seven years. Let Which me also answer you, because remember we take owned animals instead yeah. of instead of stray animals. So it's not like we're finding cats people have abandoned. However, the number one reason people bring animals to Green Hill is because their housing options have changed, and many of those are college students. So. I would say that if you're not willing to make a commitment to an animal past college, because very few of them only live four years, um, <laughs> you should probably not adopt and you should probably not make that commitment to begin with. Because to me, it's cruelty to ask that animal to all of a sudden be without you. Yeah. You know, even if we can find it another home, how long I'm does it have to live too. in a shelter environment in between? You know, how long? If your parents dropped you somewhere and they left, you would think they were coming back. And every day that they didn't come back, that would be very worrisome to you. And shelter animals go through that same psychology. It's very difficult for them to adjust, even though we take the best care that we can and we love them like they were our own, it's very difficult for them to adjust that the same person isn't coming back. And then they have to form bonds. And some of them, at Green Hill, they can stay as long as it takes to get adopted, as long as they're healthy and happy, so there's not time limits. So sometimes they form bonds with us, and then suddenly they get adopted and they're, we're gone. You know? And so it's, it's very hard psychologically to ask an animal to go through that, even if it turns out like that they have a new home. So I would say there are alternatives that would be better. And one of them is if you, colleges can be lonely, you want a buddy. I did when I was in college, and so I fostered. Um, and fostering is like having an animal part-time. Um, there are animals at Green Hill that are too young or recovering from an injury like the little Yorkie with the broken leg or the dog who had the babies and they need a place to go for um, a temporary stay before they get adopted. And so we use foster homes and you care for that animal like it's your own and then you give it back. Um, and that is a really, really good alternative to someone who can't make a lifetime commitment right now because you know when I was in college, I lived in Boston and I'm not still in Boston, you know, and it would be hard to have carted animals cross country with me. And so I fostered, the average stay in foster at Green Hill is 29 days. So for about a month, you have an animal, dogs, cats, kittens, puppies. Um, or if you need your animal fixed, come down to either of the shelters <laughs> and interact with the animals. I mean, we have dog walkers, 
both of us. We have cat socializers, sure. um, all kinds of stuff going on. So, I mean, we always invite everybody down. Yeah, and, and those are much better options than making a commitment that you really can't see through. Plus, I think students also should know how expensive it is, I think, to take care of a companion animal well. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, because Marley here <laughs> is 14, has like hyperthyroidism and diabetes, and I mean, I probably spend several thousand dollars on her a year. And I mean, I think that's what that's what it takes, and she gets high quality food and all that stuff. Um, but and so I can't own another animal because I feel like to take care of her, I have a commitment to her. So I think a lot of students, the fostering idea is great, or volunteering to get your animal fix or whatever, because um, I think that I, some students might be like, oh well, I'm not going to buy quality food, and I'm just, or you know, I I'm not going to take them to the vet like I should, and those kinds of things because I just don't have the money. So maybe wait until you have a more set salary before you make a commitment to the veterinary care that's needed. Um, I had a, qu a couple questions. Um, so I, I know that you said that they can st the animals can stay at Green Hill for as long as they want. So I was just wondering, so do you, uh, you guys, I, I came in late so you might have said so, but. No. I was wondering if you put them down, and if not, then what is the capacity, and what do you do with the animals once you reach capacity? Okay, so it's a multifaceted answer. Yes, euthanasia does happen at Green Hill, um, and that would happen if an animal was sick beyond our capacity to treat it, um, because animals get sick, and we have a foster program, but sometimes if we find out that an animal that has appeared healthy is diagnosed with cancer or something like that that we, we can't treat, then we would euthanize that animal or animals that are unhappy. Um, being in a shelter is a really stressful environment and it's really hard on an animal and there are psychological changes that happen within the brain of those animals if they're in you know, captivity for too long, if they're in a shelter environment. Because you think about, especially with dogs, if you walk into the kennel, it's really loud all the time and so it's not like being at home because they have to deal with it being loud and they're confined and it's very frustrating because the people are walking by but they're not taking them out. And so um, animals start to, to undergo changes um, and it, it's very individual. It happens sometimes in two weeks, sometimes in six months, right? So there's no hard and fast rule. But if an animal um, is starting to become unhappy, then we think that's cruelty to make him wait longer. So we would try to exhaust every possibility first. We, would, we have a network of rescue groups that we work with so we might transfer him out to a rescue group or to another shelter. We do deal with OHS quite a bit and try to get a different adopter pool to see him. We work with behaviorists who come in and try to come up with some activities that would engage that animal a little more. Um, we have foster homes where the animal would go. But if an animal has been through all these things and is just miserable in that kind of environment, then that would be a reason to, to end that suffering. And then I was also just wondering, how do you screen the foster homes, if any? Um, we do. There's a, a, an orientation that you have to go through and some classes that you have to take and then um, we have a foster care manager who manages those people and she would offer you the education you needed and be in constant contact with the medical staff who you know, would offer you that aspect of things. There was another part to your question that I wanted to answer, the first one, and I don't remember what it was now. What do you do with the animals? Capacity. Capacity, yes. Oh. That's exactly what it was. Thank you. Um, we are really privileged that Green Hill is what's called a limited admission facility, which means we operate on appointment, so we don't run out of space. We manage that space, and that enables us to not have to do euthanasia very often because we don't take any animal that shows up at the door. We schedule appointments, and we say, well, we're, we're full right now. Can you come back in two weeks? And then that will give us a chance to um, do some adoptions, ship some things around, and then we schedule the appointments. Does that make sense? Yeah. So capacity is about 250 animals at, at one time and then about 250 in foster care. So 500 total. And last question, I promise. Okay, yeah. so um, as far as the shelter um, care goes for the animals, mm -hmm. um, if there was someone who um, wanted to volunteer, what is the most needed service? Because I know that uh, we can walk the animals. Um, I know people bring food to donate and stuff like that. So I was just wondering what is the most um, necessary? <clears throat> well, it's all necessary. So 250 animals at Green Hill on any given day, there are 16 staff members. So everybody else who takes care of those animals is a volunteer. 
takes about 100 volunteers on a regular basis to help us care for those animals at the shelter. Um, I would say one of the most important things is walking the dogs so that they get a break from that pent upness and they get to exercise. We have 20 acres of trails. Um, we need help with cleaning all the time. Um, there are a hundred and some odd cats in our cattery right now and two people on any given day who clean up after them. So it takes a lot of time to staff people. Our small animal room is not staffed by any staff person. It's entirely volunteer run. So the cleaning, the socializing, um, and then it sounds horrible, but you asked money. Money is always an issue. So if you could make a financial donation, all that money, we're 100% funded by the community, so all that money goes straight to help the animals. We don't get any grants or, or federal or state funding or anything like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I have a question from Mark and Mike and anyone else. And I know you mentioned that your commissioned authority doesn't extend to commercial agriculture. But in, in terms of, of pet stores that are selling dogs and cats, and I've seen mm -hmm. conditions in pet stores that almost rival some of the pictures. Mike had dogs that can't stand up in their cages. I'm told that they're walked, but I've, I've never seen these pet stores walk the animals. So I'm just curious, is, is that something that you can intervene in, in kind of commercial companion animal? Absolutely, we okay. do, we do. And we, we probably, and the, the pet stores that are in our area, Multnomah County, um, Scamps is a big one, and I don't want to name, because some are, a lot of them are unfounded. I mean, I would say we probably average a, at least 100, maybe 200 calls on pet stores. Um, a lot of them are unfounded. A lot of them, somebody will go there, they'll look down, there's no water for the dog, um, there's no mat for the dog, it's just sitting on the bare wire. And it might just be the five minutes that they're cleaning the mat because he just, you know, went to the bathroom on it or so forth. Um, I had three last week in, 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 in there. We do, we do go on those. A lot of them, we've already built up rapport with the managers. We've been there multiple times. Um, we, we get a complaint, we'll call and say, hey, this is what we got. If it's a new manager, if it's a new store we've never been to, and it's a legitimate you know, accusation of a crime, we'll go out. We just go out there, talk to them. Um, we've, had, we've got a, a reptile store in Southeast. Uh, we've been out there multiple times. Um, some of the complaints are founded. Um, we will report that to animal control um, if there's licensing or things that go forth. But if it's, if it's a cruelty crime allegation, and we have no history with that, store then we will go out and look at look at it but most of them I have to say are generally unfounded for at least for our area locally you want to talk about locally uh, we run across about the same thing on legitimate pet stores you know the corporation pet stores uh, there's a few mom-and-pop pet stores that we have in the county usually they're unfounded uh, we do have a couple that are continual problems the, what we have the problem with is within our code there is nothing guiding pet stores or governing pet stores it has to go through uh, USDA and usually they won't do anything unless it's an animal that uh, they're not supposed to own so the neglect and the cruelty part of it for us to go in there because of the financial and tying up courts and trying to go criminal on these people, uh, there's just no resources. And it's hard to do. It's real hard to do. Yeah, and we'll follow up on that too. Our biggest problem are what we call backyard breeders, people yeah. that are selling puppies exclusively for money. And there are some, you know, and I'm, I'm torn too. There's so many animals in shelters. Why would you buy an animal from a breeder? Um, I, I have met some phenomenal breeders that actually lose thousands of dollars a year. They love the animals, they breed maybe once a year. Um, and again, I'm not gonna take a position on that, but you get a lot of people that, I, I had a guy up in Columbia County, he's only allowed to have three dogs, didn't have any licensing or permitting with animal control. Um, and I was about ready to leave and I said, hey, can I just check out your basement real quick? Somebody said that you had some dogs and I went downstairs. He had about 20 dogs down in his basement. Um, the conditions in them themselves were not criminal but he had sold multiple litters of puppies that had everything from Parvo, just covered in worms. Um, and he's doing it just to make money. He sells them for yeah. 600 bucks a pop. And it's a two-way side because he wouldn't be in business if people weren't buying those puppies. And my complainants were outraged. You know, they took their dog to the vet and $2,000 later, and how can this happen? And I, you know, again, I don't want to take a position, but I said, you know, why don't you come to the Oregon Humane Society or go to your county humane society? That's tiny compared to us. And, um, but the backyard breeders are a huge problem. They are doing exclusively for money and they're not doing it properly. And it's hard, the regulation in a lot of counties isn't there. It's very difficult to say, you know, you, 
for an administrative, you have to, you basically have to prove a criminal case of neglect or abuse to shut them down, which is tough. And one of the things, and I'm sure you probably ran across here, I don't know if you noticed it or not, is that years back when they came up really hitting felons, getting out of jail about owning weapons and all of that, they quit carrying weapons and they started breeding and, and buying mean dogs. And what they would do is they would devocalize them. And I don't know if you ever ran across any of those. But so what would happen is if their parole officer, probation officer, uh, they were gonna do a raid on, on the home, that the dogs, they couldn't hear the dogs coming. And so the dogs would go after whoever was doing the raid. So now, through new uh, legislation, or I don't actually don't know how old it is. I, I don't think it's very old. We have the right, if we have contact with a felon, that we're gonna deem his dog dangerous, basically we can just take it because he's not allowed to have it now. And it's written into our parole and probation that they're not allowed to have a dangerous animal. So we're making strides, but I think the biggest problem that we have is, is resources. That's it, you know. If anybody wants any more information about animal control, uh, come on down and visit us. We also oh, will let you do ride-alongs with the officers. Yeah. Uh, see what we go through. Yeah. Yeah.